Pilpeles kolshehu v'yitron kolshehu. These substances, the threshold for are being hit with a penalty. Yeah, yeah, they're here. The, the penalty is pilpeles kolshehu. But what is pilpeles? Pilpeles, I'm not quite sure what it is, but I know it wasn't it wasn't pepper. Okay? It has a tough edit. It's something that's peppery and spicy. It's the equivalent of mint gum back in the day. For someone, mint gum. Remember? Someone doesn't have a breath mint. Okay? Yeah. Low alenu. So that's what they used to use back in the day. So any amount, enough for him to chew. And this, if this was pill pill the spice, it would have fallen under the jurisdiction of the previous mission, which talked about, you know, how much spice does a person, or how much part of spice would a person uh, move around on Shabbos in the public domain in order to be hit with the penalty? So in this case, it's not spice, it's something else named after spice, named after uh, pepper. It continues over here in Itron. Itron also is tar, but this is uh, tar from apparently a vegetable source. You get tar, once again, from burning things. We're talking about different types of spices. Also, any amount, same thing with metal, like we discussed last time. People used to not throw away metal. Nowadays, we throw away metal, but they used to save it because what metal did you have around? It was usually just tin, iron, or lead. And those always had purposes. You make things out of them. But nowadays, we throw we throw everything away, especially aluminum. Next. Uh, uh, this was a uh, saying I was discussing with my the guy I was just in the car with is it makak or mekek if the shorish is mem kuf kuf the word is mekek and if the shorish is nun kuf kuf or lamid kuf kuf the, the word is makak and I'm not quite sure because it's not a biblical word any way you slice it so that's what it is that's the rot that's left over from books, books. By books, they mean scrolls written on cloth. Yeah, it's true. There were ways to write on uh, uh, rudimentary paper back in the day, diphthera, papyrus, and things like that. That wasn't what Jews normally did, though. When you had real sfarim, you wanted them to last. And also, halakhically speaking, they have to be written on animal skin. So that's how you wrote it. And as you know, those things last for hundreds and hundreds of years. Uh, so that's what it's saying, makak sfarim. But eventually, you know, it, it also decomposes. Why would people have stones from the altar or, or dust left from the altar? How do you even get your hands on such a thing? Where did that come from? So the ancient Jewish practice used to be people did hold on to these things. They used to bury people with hard, uh, dust from Eretz Yisrael. And they, they, nowadays you probably saw they put ashes on the groom's head in the tefillin spot. They, it used to be the older minhag wasn't ashes, but actually... This type of thing, you know, remnants of the temple. And uh, you're probably familiar with the minig of Sherbalach. What's well, Sherbalach? Anybody ever seen Sherbalach? Thank God. So what's Sherbalach? The, the Hever Kadisha in Hutzlar, it's instead of holding dirt for Mary Tisrael, they make they turn the dirt into pieces of earthenware and just little earthenware shards made from Eric Tisrael's earth, and they would bury people with Sherbalach. A few Sherbalach they put on the face. In plastic, okay, so that, that that's that's the standard way of doing it. The sherbalach was an older way, mm -hmm. and they'd even put the sherbalach and dafka cover the deceased's eyes and mouth with these pieces of pottery. So I I'm proud to say that I have now actually one of these things at home. It turns out the second temple was destroyed, and the second temple was quite a, a sight to see. Its outer walls were made of the finest marble. That the that Herod could get, and it's well known, tested to in history. The problem is they destroyed the temple. Marble does not burn. The second temple was destroyed. Now Jews eventually got back there and wanted to rebuild the temple in the second century. That was the whole Bar Kokhba revolt. They did not finish doing so, and the whatever structure he had he had there was converted into a temple of Jupiter by the Romans, uh, the their equivalent of the god Zeus. And eventually there was other conquests, but no one, really went to, sorry, no one has really gone to Harabayas in the intervening time of the people who really belong there and have done a serious job cleaning up the place, especially on the eastern side. And that's why there are many antiquities, pieces of what used to be the, the temple, all different parts of it in the outer courtyards are still on Harabayas. And there was a lot, as you know, that uh, the usual bad guys 
were trying to take away from there. They're shipping out in trucks and dumping it in the Kidron Valley. And you could take your, your kids to go and you know sift through and actually find some things. So I have in my possession a piece of the outer wall of the Second Temple. So the marble from it, there's other pieces. There's some green marble, some lighter colored marble. And uh, how we got this piece is a little bit of a complicated story, but it's actually quite, I don't know, I, I find it's the most shaking thing. It reminds me of uh, Rabbi Yochanan used to carry around, it says, uh, his son's tailbone. He lost all his children. Rabbi Yochanan buried all his children and kept one of their bones as sort of a memento. It sort of reminded him, kept him sad. So I have a piece of uh, the outer wall of the temple. It's pretty, pretty certain that that's what it is. And uh, this block... And that's the type of thing you'd scrape off some of the dust from that and put on the chassan's head. And that's what they're discussing here, except they used to take it from the altar. Why Why dafka the dirt of the altar as opposed to, let's say, the walls of the temple, of which there were many that were knocked down? Why would they take dirt from the altar or, you know, the, the stones of the altar? What was the altar have over, let's say, the actual temple? The altar atones. Okay? The mizbeach is dafka supposed to be made out of stone or made out of dirt. Here's how you do it. The altar is basically attached to the ground. It's not a kli. It's uh, an extension of the ground. It's mechubar karka, And it is there that man was created, and that's what atones for him. Really, man should be buried at the site of the temple, because that's where, at the site of the altar, that's where it was created. Hamash Belong, God has, gave man the altar to atone for him while he is yet alive, so he doesn't have to die. So the atonement, the, the altar affects atonement, and that's why they would specifically take the dirt of there. The outer walls of the temple don't have any uh, kedusha once the temple's been destroyed. Okay? Bo pritzim lichiluluha. It's been desecrated already. So that, that's what we happen to have, and that's what people would keep as mementos, and when they would eventually bury it, it was considered significant in any amount. That's why any amount of these things, these are considered kodesh. Let's see. Um... That means the gartels, or what we call the mantle of the Sfarim, also eventually, they, you know, they're, they're not useful anymore. They're falling apart. So, kol shehein, no, also, the, the shear is any amount. Because those are all put in Geniza. Any amount that's treated with respect. So, any amount that you carry on Shabbos would be a threshold for an Isser. Rabbi Yudo Omer, Afa motzi mishamashe avo if for whatever reason you have a Jew who has something idolatrous, Misham Zara, also the shear for that, Koshehu, any amount. The, the, there's an Isra in the Torah, it says in Sefer Dvarim, you shouldn't keep any of it. Meuma. Meuma is, is the biblical word for Koshehu. Or in uh, or in Aramaic, Mid'an. Any amount uh, from this Kherim, from the band, that, that which you shouldn't have. So, because the Torah gives a chashivus, a significance to a me'umah v'avodazara, that's the threshold of a shir. Let's, uh, of the threshold of a shir iser, or a shir kares, if a person were to do this unwittingly, uh, for violating Shabbos. The question came up, a person who's completely unwitting, let's say uh, he, he had something in his pocket, and it turns out he was walking around on Shabbos all the time, he only discovered it later, and it's significant, uh, so he, he's not a shogeg, he's, a, he's just a misasek, he's completely putter from any any uh, punishment, because you're completely unaware. Even if it was the case, you mentioned the sandwich. Well, what happens if he discovered he had been walking around with the sandwich all the time? Now he's sitting in Rosh Hashanah. He went from one Rosh Hashanah to another via Rosh Hashanah for a 10-minute walk, and he discovered that he had a sandwich in his pocket, or it was a candy, whatever it is. And now he intends to eat this thing that he's discovered in his pocket. It's a different question. He, he technically can eat what he f discovers because it's there, and it was brought. It was brought there, not necessarily the iser, but no one did an iser to bring it to him. Okay? No one intended to do an iser here. Normally, there's only prohibition. The, when you say the results on Shabbos, Malachas Shabbos are considered prohibited when there was someone's intention. They talk about the person who did it and for whom did he do it, whether it was a guy who did it. So there's a machlokas, major rishon and machronim. What's the exact halacha? Is it how, how long after Shabbos is it forbidden? Or is it mutter on Shabbos, b'shogeg? The point is, in this case, because we're dealing with the Misasik, there is no gzera against it, and you can eat the sandwich right away. And just make sure, before you walk outside on Shabbos, check your pockets, like they still do in places where there's a Rosh Hashanah. Rashi says, Pilpaz kol shehu ve'eno pilpel shelanu. kol shehu l'may So it's not pilpel, it's not the spice that we described last week, black pepper or white pepper. 
And uh, in the Gemara, they'll explain what do you, they do with pill palace. Mini besamin kol shehein. Why? L'reach to. Because it just takes a little bit of besamin to affect a good smell. And also that's why, unlike food, if you were saying, bori mini besamin, berkas ananim on some sort of besamin, how much does it take? A single clove, like we have for besamin, is that a sheer kazayas? If the cloves were forbidden to eat, let's say, you could, you could manage to cook them, so they have a sheer kazayas. But the smell cloves, it just takes a little bit of the clove powder even. Just rub a little bit on your fingers, and it's significant. Next. Mini matachot kol shehu, ra'ui dorban or darbain? What do you have there? Dorban with a comments. I thought it should be darbain. But what is a darbain? A goad. Okay? Not a goad, these things. It used to be, once again, they'd never throw away scrap metal. You could use it for something. Wow, oh, everybody's here. We have a, quite a large contingency online. Shemats Nino Tolir Fuwa. Rashi says Lo Garcino. That's why this line that Rashi has, he mentions it is there. It's not in our Mishnah. This is a line that's in certain Mishnayas that they'd keep these uh, some of these items, Mini Mateche and Mini Bisamim, for Rafua. But Rashi doesn't have such a line in his Mishnah. Do you have a, anybody have a different printing that has these words in, let's say, parentheses in his Mishnah? No, okay. Makak Svarim, Achilat Tolaim, Ochelera Svarim, Umirakavan, Ushmo Makak. Rashi, Makak Svarim. Yeah, yes, I am. Rashi, yeah, Rashi of the Mishnah. It, the, there, there are these larvae of these types of bugs. They would eat up the Svarim, it would get rotten, and that's what they call it. What's left of the Svarim after it's been chewed up by these bugs. Shematznin Otan Lingonzan, Rashi says, Shakol Davar Kodesh to Ungniza. Anything holy should be buried properly, Geniza. So that's why they would treat what was left of holy things. Uh, they would treat it with uh, the utmost respect. It used to be when Jewish people go out to war, they take the Ark of the Covenant sometimes. Machlokas, some say it wasn't the Ark of the Covenant they would go out to war. That was very rare. That's only certain instances. They had a second Ark to hold the Shivrei Luchos. Most say that no, there was only there was but one ark, the Shivrei Luchos. That was the first uh, uh, tablets, and the second ones were in the Ark of the Covenant, of which there was only one. Now, uh, it seems that, especially if you learn it the Brisker style, what's the holiest object you could create in Judaism today? The one that needs to be given the most respect, also the Sefer Torah. Sefer Torah gives its kedusha to the base Knesset, and everything connected to the Sefer Torah has. Uh, a derivative kedusha of the Sefer Torah. And you have to stand up for the Sefer Torah, etc. It, it seems, based on Serb Sukkim, which is beyond the scope of what we're dealing with now, in Sefer Yirmiyahu, that indeed, if a Jewish army or parts of a Jewish army were to go out carrying a Sefer Torah, they have an ark with a Sefer Torah in it, that would be just like taking the Ark of the Covenant out to war. Okay? It's a, it, you know, it, it brings uh, whatever God's presence is there is also on the Sefer Torah and also holiness and it's a good thing for the soldiers to have. And that's why I would hope that every group of Jewish soldiers has a Sefer Torah with them. Or at least the army should go out with a Sefer Torah. Let's see. Uh, okay. Meuma. Rashi is going to talk about this word Meuma with regards to idolatrous items. Alma, Achshave Kra, Le'isura. The Torah, that's the Kra, says that these type of items have been given significance why? Because the Torah says so. Me'uma. You shouldn't have any little bit of a vodazar left, so that's the significant amount. It's like chametz on Pesach. Any amount. You can't. Well, you're The Torah said it's an Easter, so you can't have it. Let's see. It said earlier that anything that's not worth keeping, then uh, you shouldn't be hit with a prohibition with having carried this around outside. Right? It's not worth keeping any of this. He says, He said, yeah, it's talking about wood taken from a Sherah tree. It doesn't look like Rabbi Yehuda. And the, the other opinion that we had earlier doesn't follow Rabbi Yehuda. Rabbi Yehuda says any bit of a Vodazara. And earlier they said, no, Atzei Asherah, that's a tree they used to worship. Actually, there is a threshold for Isser. If you have a twig from an Eitz Asherah that has no use whatsoever, so you're not going to be hit with an Avera for carrying this around outside. Why would anybody have such a thing, though? Why was he carrying a, a piece of Avodah Zara? The answer, he's, he was meaning to dispose of it. He discovered it around the house on Shabbos, for whatever reason, 
and he can only destroy it after Shabbos. Why? What's the meaning means of destruction for such a thing? Burning it. But he can't burn it on Shabbos. Like Nosar. What do you do with the Nosar from the Korban? Korban Pesach, you, know, you can only eat it the night of the Seder. And by midnight already, you couldn't. You can't eat a Gzera de Rabbanon. And then those who say that even the Gzera extends to uh, the Tuma. The Tuma that of Nosar kicks in already at midnight because now the Chazal made it Nosar. But either way, Mido Raisa becomes Nosar at dawn. So you're supposed to burn the leftover Korban Pesach meat and anything that was on the table with it. But when do you burn the Korban Pesach meat? You can't do it on Yontif. That's disposal of Kudshim. The answer, save it for after Yontif and you burn it after Yontif. So too, if you'd have something like this, Chomets, that which you have to destroy, or Chas Shalom, some sort of, uh, I don't know, uh, 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 here, Gary the guy left his crucifix lying around your house. So you'd have to destroy it after after Shabbos. Let's see the Gemara over here. Unless there's a Rashi here. No, I think I think we saw all the Rashis here. Sorry, the Tosfos. Pilpela has Kol Shehu, Lamai Chazya, what do they use Popelis for? For treating bad breath. Okay. Itran Kolshehu. What do they do with Itran? Lamai Chazya? With Silichata. Silichata, Rashi says, is uh, a half side of the head headache. Okay? As I, I tell my wife, a left side of the head headache. Because once you get to a certain age, you have your, it turns out your, the coating of your skull it has muscles in it. You have muscles all around your head that are connected to your neck muscles and your shoulder muscles. And you sometimes don't get enough sleep. So all these things cause muscular problems and they're felt as headache in certain parts of the head. Or you could have even the classic migraine. And migraine means the nerves are firing wrong. So you feel the headache at different parts of your head. If you, you're a youngster and you have a headache, so it means you actually have a pain there, something can hit your head. So you feel it in your head. But when you get older, the for some reason, the aches and pains have very specific places, usually because particular nerves or muscles. So that's what Rashi is describing. So they would use itron, which is, comes from the tree, to treat headaches okay? or, or migraines. When this is uh, possibly talking about substances similar to uh, rudimentary aspirin. Where does aspirin come from? That's salicylic acid. Salicylic acid has been known to people for a long time. You take a little salicylic acid, your pains go away. The problem with salicylic acid is, well, you could also wash your skin with it. It helps with acne. Well-known facts of history and medicine. However, what's the problem with you taking a little bit of salicylic acid from the tree to treat your headache? It also causes stomach aches. It even causes an ulcer if you take too much. So Bayer came up with the idea, oh, when you combine your salicylic acid with acetic acid with vinegar, and you get acetyl salicylic acid, you get an aspirin that doesn't hurt your stomach so much. That's aspirin. And that's what he invented, Bayer. That's why that was the brand. And it turns out, eventually, it breaks down. It separates again into the vinegar and just the salicylic acid. So if you are uh, you open up your aspirin bottle, there's a vinegary smell. That means it's already expired. Migraine comes to the word hemicrenia, i.e. half of the head. Yeah. They also say that, I think Steinzaltz points out something like that. There's a Rashi word somewhere here that also says migra, something or other. Yeah. Hemicrania. The hemi means like half side, like hemisphere. And crania. That's just a, yeah, so you, you have to watch out. But the fact is that people knew about certain pain relievers uh, for a long time. And like most medicines also, you have to watch out. There's always a side effect. Let's see here. Uh, oh, PNA. Mini besum in kolshahim. What kind of besum we have? Tona Rabbanum. Someone who takes out a reach ra koshu. Can you transport a smell? What does it mean to transport a smell? Rashi says, Reach Ra, Shema Ashanin Bahan, Cholin Vitino Kot, Kigon, Chiltit, La Riach me loves Mazikin. Okay. So it means some sort of substance that they would burn, okay, in order to get away the pests. Fumigation. They do it for sick people or for children. That's what he means. The substance that I'd use for fumigating. How much is that? Once again, very little. This takes a little bit put on the coal and it will burn. Nowadays, people use types of incense, very little amount. Anybody here smoke hookah before? No. I guess we're all too American. Neither have I. But how do they do it? They just take a little bit of substance. And they put it on this coal and then they, they smoke it like that. But instead of letting it fill the room and chase away the bugs, they dafka fill their lungs with it and then they hurt themselves. 
Okay. Mm-hmm. Okay, and reach uh uh reach rock kol shehu shemen tov kol shehu any amount of good oil. What do people use shemen tov for? Well, all sorts of treatments and also for smelling good. Where do we they sell shemen tov? You go to any of those <clears throat> natural stores or specialty shops, and they'll actually sell you small vials with a dropper of lavender and rose oil and all sorts of things. How much does that cost? I don't know, but they're expensive. You look at them; they're this little nothing of a bottle. And, uh, you know, they're, they're easily more than 20 shekels each. That's what they're talking about here. Shemento, just a little bit of this good smelling oils of different derivatives is uh, a shear on Shabbos. Argamon kolshehu, just a little bit of argamon. What can you do with a little bit of argamon? Can you make it argamon, at least when I was looking at the last four parshas, was, this, was a substance. It means uh, wool dyed purple. And they use it, at least religiously, for uh, the big day kahuna, and for the curtains that were in the temple. But you and I don't have a commandment, let's say, to put argaman on our tzitzis, like we do tzitzis. So what is argaman here? It means a little bit of wool. No, Shev, uh, Rashi says, Tseva shetsovi imbo argaman. Mitama loit paresh. He says it's just a little bit of the dye that they use to dye argaman, which is, in this case, the wool. And the reason has not been explained. Veli nira shegam hu ro'i lahariach. Maybe it has a good smell. Unfortunately, Rashi is incorrect. The argamon dye actually has a pretty bad smell. Like we discussed before, it smells just like the techeles dye, which also has a certain chimut to it, as Rashi would say, in regards to other things. It smells pretty bad, but the product is expensive because they used to make just a little bit of argamon dye is enough to dye a lot of wool. Okay, a tuft of wool, and then you could do it. Why was argamon so important? Because unlike all the other colors or the other dyes that we mentioned, the other Mishnah, those were cheap vegetable-based dyes that gave a red color, whatever it is. Argamon was considered a much more expensive kind of color for specifically for wool. It was considered royal. It's the basis for the royal purple. When you when they see the Roman emperor had a purple cape. That was what it was talking about. It was made from argamon. That's why they were so big in trying to make it take it away from the Jews. Only their types of people should have it. Because I'll ask, of all its fuim, when they have that classic uh, classic medrash that talks about why we make treles, why treles tafka for tzitzis, they say treles reflects the color of the sea, which is the color of the sky, which is the color of kisya kavod. The gemara, the medrash first says, of all its fuim. It doesn't mean of all the colors you can have, but of all the colors of wool. As opposed to, when they say this, of white argamon and tulachani. You could have just said, make your tzitzis regular white wool, or use a black sheep's wool, or make it argamon or tulachani. Those are also fancy and expensive. Why not those? And the answer is, techeles was chosen because it reminds you of the mitzvahs more than the other ones. Argamon wouldn't remind you of anything. It's just a very expensive royal dye, like uh, like that sweater over there. But it doesn't it, it doesn't help you remember the mitzvahs. Let's see here. Uh, he continues, Uvsula Savered Achas. That's a, a rosebud that has yet to open. Rashi says, Ale Shalvered Bachur Achat. One single one. What do they do with this? It's not, it's not a flower. So what use does it have? The answer, use it to get out its oil. You can make rose, uh, you make, uh, yeah, uh, they, they have a rose oil or rose flavor. Nowadays, we don't see it so much. Ashkenazim don't use it, but Spartan use it all the time. They actually have this rose water stuff they make from it. What do they do with the rose water? Well, they sprinkle it. Well, sometimes they sprinkle it around shul. They sprinkle it on their hands for basamim. The, 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 the halabim do that, right? That's why their shul smells like it. Or they put it in these overly sweet pastry things that they eat. Also has taste of rose water. I find it tastes like soap, so I wonder why they eat it like that. Okay. I guess I just don't come from the right culture. Uh, the halacha is, according to Minag Ashkenaz, that if you're going to make a cake, it should taste like chocolate. And if you're going to make cookies, it should be chocolate chip cookies. And if you're going to make a pie, it should be apple. Everything else is considered a shinui and is not to be done. Let's see. Um, that's just my opinion. Any amount of metal. This is before they discovered most metals. The only things they had back then was iron, tin, and lead, or the slightly precious metals, gold, silver, and copper, and alloys of all those things, but everything else is, is, uh, wasn't yet to be discovered or refined, even though it exists. So when they say metals, they're talking about iron, tin, and lead. If they're talking about gold and silver, 
obviously gold and silver. Just small amounts of gold and silver are currency. How did they used to measure? Uh, what was the smallest measure of silver that was used as currency back in the day? Well, a shekel in this week's Parsha, uh, in Parsha's uh, Pekude, read Kesef Pekude, was the Machatis a shekel, right? How much is Machatis a shekel? 9.6 grams or so. And that's Esrim Geira was the shekel. So a Geira is a single grain of silver. So that's one that's one twentieth of 18 point, uh, no, it's so 20 point, 19.2 grams, okay? So it's just a little bit a gram, or the word grain, and that's how much that's how much silver actually had as a small matbeo, okay? The smallest amount that they were counting silver. So obviously silver and gold are worth their weight in silver or gold. So that's not what they're talking about here. So they used to they used to recycle these things a lot. They would use it mini matachot uh That's the Mishnah Rashi points out. The Mai Khazu, what they use this for, Tanya Rabbi Shimon ben Lazar Omer, Shekane Raui La Sumimenu Darbain Katan. You can make a small goat out of it, anything, well, even whatever you need out of metal. You could, it's, it's small enough that it actually has some use for it. You can make a spike out of it also. A piece of, in Maseches Kain, they talk about a piece of wood with a little metal spike at the end. Very rudimentary device, but people still use those types of things. Tanu Rabbanon, Omer Hareolai Barzel, Acherim Omrim, Lo Yifkod, Me Ama Al Ama. The person says, Hare Alai Barzel. Iron be upon me. No, that's not what it means. Iron be upon me it means I take upon myself to donate iron to the temple. Now, in the olden days, people used to say, you know, those who wanted to give would give gold and silver that they have used, or even bronze for the kalim. A person says iron for the temple. What would they use iron for? What would they use iron in the temple? Well, technically speaking, they made knives. They had shechita knives. We're saying they use in the temple, and they even would go through them once the the knife is no longer good. They would have a place where they'd put them in, into Geniza. So they would always have new knives in the temple. But the Acherim say that if a person takes upon himself to donate iron to the temple, he has to donate a certain amount, and that is uh, an ama by an ama, okay? a sheet of iron that's one ama by one ama, about one and a half feet by one and a half feet. Now, what do you, what's the thickness of this iron sheet? I would venture that it's actually quite thin, uh, like razor thin. But it has to be that way. Why? Lamai Chazya, Amar Rav Yosef. What's its use? Rav Yosef says, the Chalya Orev. It's good for, uh, this is, literally is a scarecrow. Orev is a scarecrow, but it doesn't mean scare. It means get rid of the crows. What is it? The spikes, the sharp spiky things they put on the roof of the temple so that birds do not rest on the temple. That's the Chalya Orev. That's why I believe it didn't mention the third dimension. It just says, uh, ama by an ama square, but the thickness doesn't need to be thick. If it was a thick piece of iron, the birds would have a fine time sitting on it. You want it to be sharp, you know, thin and sharp, so that it's unpleasant for these birds to sit on. And that's what they used to make. Question is, how often would they need new scarecrows for the roof of the temple? Once they put, once they cover the roof with these things, and that's, you know, to the right extent, they would be there forever. Were someone removing them? The answer is, we're talking about iron. In the olden days, when they used iron to make things like this that were exposed to the elements, they would rust away, and eventually they'd be useless. Nowadays, for a lot of our purposes, we do make iron fencing outside. These bars, they're made of mostly iron. So why don't they crumble apart and eventually rust after a long time? Answer, they're made of steel alloys that we have. If we want really fancy ones, we use stainless steel, and that doesn't rust. But here, we use a type of steel that's a new alloy that barely rusts, and will take a very, very long time before anything happens. So they didn't have that back in the day, so that they would put this sharp piece of iron on the temple roof. Eventually, they would need to send the levy up there and switch some out because they would, they would be almost useless. So that was the thing they were constantly rotating, just like their knives back in the day. Nowadays, how many of us have thrown away knives? Occasionally, we resharpen our kitchen knives, but our kitchen knives are made out of much stronger materials than, and also, let's say, even butcher knives are much stronger materials than they used to have. In the olden days, a knife would eventually become puzzle after a few years, and then it's just not useful. But in, And so they would melt it down and make a new knife. And the temple, they wouldn't do that. They would just put in Geniza. But nowadays, this is what we do. Vika da Amri, Acherim Omrim. There's another way of reading this teaching. The Acherim say, Lo Yifchot Mikal Yahorev. The person says he's going to donate iron to the temple, so he shouldn't give any less than can be used for the scarecrow device. 
The Chama, how much is that? Amar Rav Yosef, Amma al Amma. And it happens to be the amount is one Amma by one Amma of iron. Tosvos asks a question, where actually, you know, Tosvos points out a piece of history here. The Aruch, the Erech, Kol, see, the Aruch, which is basically a dictionary, in its entry, Kol, uh, the, the, the Shoresh, Kaf Lamid Lamid, usually means all, but sometimes uh, you have Kaf Lamid Hey. Kaf Lamid Hey means to get rid of something. Okay? Kaleotam. So he says, the Vimikdash Rishon, Mipnei Rov Kedusha, Shahayeth Abo, Lo Hawa Sarich Kalya Orev. The first temple, because of the sanctity that was there, it didn't need these things. God kept the birds off of the first temple. Right? That's what the Aruch says. Vileta, but that can't be. Why? The Far Kama de Moed Katan says in the first chapter of Moed Katan that what? Muchach Behedya Shaya Bamikdash Rishon Kalyo Rev. It says quite clearly that there, Solomon did build uh, these spikes on the rooftop to keep away the crows. So why would the Aruch say that there was no Kalyo Rev in the first temple? So they give an answer there. If you look up the sources, they say that Solomon built it but it ended up being unnecessary. Okay. There was Kal Yorev, you know, Alderech HaTeva, but Alderech Neis, the birds didn't go anywhere near it anyways. They didn't even need to get the warning. And uh, this is similar to the Mishkan. I read about the building of the Mishkan yesterday. I think it was the Parsha. And the Mishkan was a large tent, a very large area. And the Mishkan stood for hundreds of years in various forms. But the rooftop was always the same mechseh, the same cover, right? And it was made out of tachash skin, but it never says that it had to have spikes on it to keep away birds. Why? Because apparently there was no problem. The Mishkan, when the entire time it stood, did not have birds come to sit on it, wherever it was. Okay, so it didn't need it, so I guess the, the first temple was like that also. I wasn't there, so we'll leave this uh, for history class and see. We'll just say that we don't know for certain because we were not there. Hmm, let's see here. Nechoshes, in the Gemara, it says, Lo yuchot mi ma'a kesef. If you're going to give bronze to the temple, you should give the value of ma'a kesef. What's a ma'a of kesef? Well, that's a lot. That's like 100 pieces of, of silver. Okay, so you should give it. What would they do with Nechoshes in the temple? Let's say second temple times. They always new kalim. New kalim were made out of the, the regular kalim that they'd use for operating the Mizbeach were made out of Nechoshes. Okay, sometimes they had other kalim that were fancier, but that was the general sense. They were made out of bronze. What's the advantage of using bronze? It has a nice color to it. It's not exactly silvery, and it barely rusts. It was the tougher material. It gave its name to the Bronze Age. Why? Because everything they made back in the Bronze Age is still around. Why they didn't melt it down, so you dig it up, it's, it stays, you know, it has a certain permanence to it. Okay, let's see here. Tani Rabbi Eliezer Omer, loiv chot mi tzinora katana. No, you should keep a little, tzinora doesn't mean in this case a tube, but a little fork. They would use pitchfork-like things to tend to the limbs that were burning on the fire. It says sometimes that there were even cases where, this, uh, I don't know, a piece of the korban wasn't in the right place on the pyre, and it wasn't fully burned even when the time came. So sometimes in the morning, they would move pieces of previous korbanos and move them aside on the Mizbeach. How would Kohanim do this? It's hot. They would use these uh, these bronze implements to do it. And the Gemara gives a case of a Kohen who has to leave the temple. He's become contaminated somehow, so he's on his way out. And he manages with one of these long scene the road on his way out as he's walking, he knocks a limb that's on top of the pyre on the Mizbeach and causes it to burn more. That's the way a Kohen can do the Avodah in state of Tuma while walking out. Okay? They, they entertain this idea. But here we're talking about let's see Nor Katana Raj. She says, Mazle Katan, a little fork, Ke'en She Tawinbo Zahav. If you were to, let's say, I don't know, spin gold, why would they be spinning gold? It doesn't mean to create gold like a rumple stiltskin. It means to uh, to make it really fine and then put it into threads, like what's mentioned in last week's parsha, the Kitsaits Pitilim. They would bang the gold really fine. And then even make it into thread-like things. Why would they make gold threads? The answer, because the certain big day kahuna were made with actual golden threads. And also they were making parochos, they were making curtains, actual gold embroidery. Yeah. And Uveda Kabayeth, 
or, or it's for Bedek Abayas. So what would you do with such a thing? Yeah, you could do you could do what you can with it. The Gemara will say over here. They would use it as tweezers, let's say, for the wicks of the menorah. Or they would use it to clean out the, the lamps of the menorah. You always need small tools. And uh, Rashi says here, mochatin bo papiot. What's the difference between mochatin and mechatatin? One's in the PO, one's in the pal. Uh, he says, minachvim. I think, ooh, look at that. There's a dis- different edition here that I don't have in my, my book. Do you guys have this? There's a footnote here on Rashi, number Samich. It's not letting me move to it. Does anybody else see what I see here? Those who are at home can see what I hear. Does any- I can't see the footnote. I don't know where it's leading to, but it's over here. By the way, it says they would punch holes in the heads. Menachvim rashihen laduye choshkan. Okay? They would, what, what would that be? You, you want to thread it through for the patilos. So you have to make a little hole, right? As soon as you make really fine holes. I can't seem to find what Rashi's talking about over here. I don't know where on the page it's pointing me. But they put in, in this Oz Bahadur edition, they have an additional footnote. I don't know what it's trying to tell us. I'm sorry, I'll find it again eventually sometime later. Okay. Makak Sparim, the Gemara says, Makak Mitpachas. Says mitpachotehen. Here it says makat mitpachas. It's written in the singular. Okay, these are things that have finally they're worn out. They're basically just the rotten leftovers of what they used to be. Yehuda makak de sifre takach di shirare. Okay, this makak of sfarim and this takach. That's the word for what's left of shirai. What's shirai? Shirai apparently means silk. Oh wow, kolelu tolainhein. See, these are all names of, of the worm that does it. In this case, like you said, it's not really worm. It's just a larva of some larger bug, but it looks like a worm. Shebechol minu min. Okay? Every, like Hebrew is a very rich language. So it depends on what's rotting. Each one has its own name to it. Each species. Mechalukin bishmotan. Takach, Ayla, Po, Ha. All the rest of ones we're going to say. Or I saw things. Some say it's Po and some say it's Pe. And sometimes it's He and sometimes it's Ha. Okay, what's the vowelization? I don't know. These aren't these aren't words we're used to using. So that's what he's saying. You can even have silk. Was there silk in the temple? This is one of those things. You ask children a question. Why didn't God ask for silk to be used in the creation of, let's say, Big Day Kahuna? Because they didn't really have silk back then. It wasn't something that it, 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 there was a little bit coming from the east, but it wasn't something that was common. Okay, so that that wasn't used. What about diamonds? How come they didn't ask for diamonds? And the answer is, what do you mean? It says there were 12 different types of precious stones used in the, in the breastplate. Many figure that diamond was one on the list. Some say, no, it wasn't. You look through that whole list, you don't have diamond. You have crystals and rubies, sapphires and emeralds, which are all also very expensive, but not necessarily diamond. But yes, in Ahinami, precious stones were used in the construction of the tabernacle. It continues. Uh, okay. Vila de Inve. Says here, or Isla de Inve, uh, the bugs that are inside. What Inve is usually grapes. Okay. Ufe de Tine, there's or fo, or fo or fe, whatever which one it is, of figs. Okay? Figs have their own type of bug in them. Wait a minute. Nowadays they tell you barely, barely can get any figs because people discovered, oh, look, figs sometimes have things inside. So what do you, how, how they used to eat them in the olden days? The answer was they knew about these things, and only that which is visible is considered utter. But in Okinami, the microscopic eggs of all these creatures in fruit, vegetable, or meat even, are not considered non-kosher. They're not visible yet. Okay. And he says the he, or the hay of Rimone, those grow in pomegranates. Kulu sakanta. They're all actually dangerous. You actually eat them, you see them, and they're there. If you eat them, you could really endanger yourself. They tell a story. There was a student who was sitting in front of Rabbi Yochanan. That means he was studying from him, listening to his words. And he was eating figs. He eats it. He's like, swallows. He says, ooh, has like, uh, peg, uh, sorry, thorns. He has a very, very thorny fig. So Rabbi Yochanan said about him, Katle pet ladain, the pet or the po, whatever it is, the, the creatures inside this 
fig have already killed this guy. Dane is him. Hargu plant la Dane. That's what Rashi says. The 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 larvae have already killed them. Why they're poisonous? I don't know what it be. But thank God nowadays, even if a person were to eat something that's infested, he might get a stomach ache, but it's not going to kill him. So I wonder what what they're referring to over here. Okay, let's see the next Mishnah. What? No, Rabbi Yochanan just noticed that. Okay, this guy's a goner. He's complaining that he he swallowed his fig and it tastes sort of spiky to it. If your take if your fig tastes spiky, it means it has something in it that you should not have had. It's like the guy uh, who ate the berries and says, "Oh, it tastes like burning." Okay, so it, it really it shouldn't shouldn't be tasting these things or feeling these sensations. It means there's something wrong. Maybe he maybe he survived, but usually if if they give the story that Rabbi Yochanan called it that yeah this guy's a goner, so I guess it did happen. Shita says, "Hamotzi kupata rochlin afal pi sheishba minin harbei." Eno chayav ela chatat achat. Kupata ruchlin, the ruchel is the peddler. The peddlers used to go around to Kana Sezra. They would go place to place and bring the equivalent of what you and I would call today cosmetics. Because women's appearances are very important for their self-esteem. Okay? That, that women have this at all ages. So that was something. The, the ruchel has a box in which he keeps many different types of things in that box. Rashi says, "Mochrei besamim the kishute nashim." They sell besamim to be used for women's adornments. Veishnem kupot ktano the tsrorot besamim. Their boxes are kind of small, but they have bundles of uh, different types of samim, many different types. So, what's the chiddush here? If you were to take one box into Rishus Arab and from Rishus Ayachid, so you're hit with one iser, one box. Oh, but you'd open up the box, you'd find 20 different types of basamim in there. 20, 20 chatos. What? It's one box. That's what the Mishnah says. It's one box. By the way, there's other Gemaras in this Masech which talk about, I don't know, a, a box full of mustard seed, and he dry, drags it out. You don't say, well, count all the seeds in there. For how many chatos he is now liable for? It's one box. Enu chai vele chatos achas rashi says, the hula chata hotzahi. One act of removing one box. Hula chada hotza. One act of hotza. Okay. Good. Now we understand that. There's a, a longer toast for us here, which I think maybe we'll do it ne- next time, of course, so we can finish the Mishnah. It says here, uh, uh, how about another How about another uh, type of thing? It comes small. Lots of different pieces. Zerone gina. Rashi, uh, Rambam says zerone gina means uh, the types of seeds that come from Vegetables used to plant other vegetables. Rambam says there's three types of seeds. There's a seeds of what you and I call true grain, the chamesha saminim. How do you plant wheat? It's a single grain of wheat. That becomes a whole stalk. So when they would farm wheat or barley or rye or spelt, like in the olden days, what would they do? Most of the crop would be for consumption and be ground into flour. But they had to keep some of the crop, not salt it, not toast it, just keep it nice and dry and safe for planting the next season. A certain percentage needed to be kept for planting the next season. And if they would eat that, they wouldn't have from what to plant the next season. So those are called dagon. And then there's other seeds that are also farmed and kept by people for consumption or for planting in the future, but they're not the true grains. So that's what you and I call kidneyos, not the Pesach kidneyos, because what that we traditionally didn't eat on Passover was very limited to certain species that they didn't eat in Europe, even though they kept with their wheat, like rice and beans and peas and things like that. But technically speaking, any crop where the seeds can be eaten by people, according to the Rama's definition, are all kidneyous for the laws of agriculture. So what does that what does that include? Basically, almost everything you can imagine that people eat, like corn and rice and peas and everything. Those are all seeds and they're all edible. Zeroneginah are different. Zeroneginah mean the seeds of things that grow from the ground that people do not use for food. They only use it to replant. So he gives the example, cabbages and cucumbers. No one's going to take out the seeds from a cucumber and use those as food ever. Sesame, yes, we grind up sesame, we get tina from it, or we press sesame seeds into a bar and we eat it like a, like a snack, etc. But uh, things like cucumber seeds are not used. What other seeds are not used? Cabbage. 
How do you grow cabbages and cauliflower and the rest of them? Those also come from seeds or tomato seeds. You could get many tomato seeds from a single tomato. You are not going to have anybody gather up a bunch of tomato seeds and say, make a meal out of this. So those are gezer onegina. Pachot mikro geret. The shear for this is less than uh, a fig. Sorry, no, maybe it's a small date. At the two. Fuse. Enough of this. It has to be enough of food. Rashi says, the afal gav the chola ochlin shiran ki grogeret. Even though with regards to foods, usually say grogeret, significant eating, not a lot. Hani kevan de lizria kaime, because zeroenegina are not meant to be eaten, they're meant to be planted. Bifachot mikro geret, nami mikhayev. Okay? Even even less than a grogeret, a person would be chayev. So does anybody here have seeds, by the way? Seeds get sold in. You buy tomato seeds or pepper seeds for planting in your yard. comes in a small packet. There's no grogeret in there, but that's still a significant amount because you could just take like five seeds and you'll have quite a few tomato uh, plants. And they last for years. You keep them in the drawer, keep them nice and dry. So that that is significant on Shabbos. Rabbi Yehuda ben Becerra says, chamisha, five of them. Let's turn the page. Takes five of them. What is he talking about? Mm. Yeah, hold on. I don't want to need to jump to the page. Here, it takes about 10 seconds to turn the doll. Okay. Uh, yeah, five seeds. Zera kishuyin shtayim. Cucumber seeds, two. Anybody ever plant cucumbers? You plant the cucumber seed, you get a single cucumber? No, you get a vine, a plant that in itself has many cucumbers, and you have to plant the next year. It's not an eights. It, causes, it creates a vine. And at the end of the season, the vine just shrivels up and it's gone. You have to plant next year. There are dilui in shnayim. In this case, it's a gourd, or they call it in modern Hebrew, the laat, similar species to a pumpkin. So it's the Israeli equivalent of a pumpkin. So those things also. Nowadays, there are people who eat uh, pumpkin seeds. Matter of fact, they, they, they're, they're expensive. But people do eat pumpkin seeds now, but maybe bite them because no one's actually going to sit around eating pumpkin seeds. Something they add as a flavoring. So maybe it's considered a spice. I don't know. But it says here, pumpkin seeds, two. Why? All it takes is to plant two pumpkin seeds. You'll get quite a few pumpkins for the next year. Uh, Zera full hamitzri shnaim. The full hamitzri, which is a type of bean, there's little seeds, which are not useful as beans themselves. So also two. Chagav chai tahor kol shehu. And if we're talking about a kosher species of locust, any amount. Culture, I guess one locust. Anybody here ever have a locust to eat? They actually sell them now. You can go to the Slifkin Museum and buy yourself a jar of roasted or uh, freeze-dried locusts. They come with a kashras on them. I don't know if Rav Herschel Schechter is the, the Rav Machshir, but he, he did eat them. And he talked about learning about it from Rav Machbud. Rav Machbud is in, in kashras. So there are people who, for whatever reason, they get them. The brach is shahakal. And uh, they're ready to eat. They say they taste like bisli. I've never had the chance to eat it. Yeah, okay. And he says, meis kigrogeris. If it's dead, it's krogeris. Why? Because they're treating it like food. Okay? So wait a minute. They, a locust was, was considered alive. What was it? It was basically a pet. Wait a minute. Jews had pets? Pets are, 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 are they mooks on Shabbos? You're allowed to carry a pet on Shabbos? Whatever it is. People used to have a locust. I guess he carries a living locust for whatever purpose. So that's chai kolshu. But if it's dead, now it's a food. But so, talk about chagav tahor. If it's chagav tamei, it's not a food necessarily because you can't eat it. Yeah. So where are we going to get this? Rashi says, Zerak kishuyin chashuvu v'chayev bishnei gargarim. The cucumber seeds. So that, that is chashivas. It's important, significant. So it just takes two of them. Hamotzi chagav chai kolshu, Rashi says. It keeps such a thing as a pet or some other animal as a pet. I, I think my, my daughter walked home. There was a certain stick-looking bug that she had, and she kept it for quite a while in a box. Okay. Do they like it? I don't know. Rabbi Huda explains in the end of the Mishnah. Okay. Let's see. Tsipores uh, or Tsiporat? I've seen both versions. You have Tsiporis, yeah, okay, but I, I have Tsiporat. But either way, it, it's a type of, as we saw before, they claim it's a type of locust that's called this, you know, bird of the vineyards. Rashi also says, the Kamei Mefarish Maihi Umai Refuato. They'll explain what it is and what's its refuah, because the only reason why you keep this thing, Bein Chaya Bein Mesa Kol Whether it's uh, alive or dead, also just Kol just one of them, apparently has some sort of 
medicinal property. I'll explain why should Matsino totally refua. They did keep it for uh, refua. Nowadays, we have a medicine cabinet. We keep things like Tylenol and aspirin. But back in the day, that's what they would have. They would keep things like itron and uh, different spices. And uh, thank God the things have. I think they've improved significantly since then. Rav Yudu Omer, Afa Motsi Chagav Chai Tamei Koshu. Rav Yudu say, no, even if a person were to have a dead Chagav, uh, okay, but, sorry, it's alive, Chagav Chai Tamei, a living, non-kosher locust, would also be a problem on Shabbos. Koshu, Shemats, Nino Tol Lekatan Lishchok Bo. Because you also keep, once the, the, the creature's alive, when do I care that it's kosher? Let the, let the kid, the kid wants to play with it. So too, most pets that you might have around the house, unless you're the type of guy who keeps chickens and sheep, most other usual pets you have around the house are not kosher, right? Most cats and dogs are not kosher. People even have snakes and lizards, gerbils. All these things are non-kosher. So Rav Yudah says that a person would keep a non-kosher locust as a pet for his child. As I'll say, so that's significant. So there's a shir on Shabbos. As I'll say, as the, the rest of the Chachamim we're talking about, a living locust that's kosher species. Okay, we'll get to this soon in the Gemara. What? Yeah, okay, so you're jumping ahead to the Gemara. Yeah. And by the way, do you only have to shech the locust before you eat it? No, oh, really? Okay, so how do, how do you, what's the shechita, the asipa? All it takes is to gather these things, like fish also. You don't have to shech the fish. Otherwise, we'd be in real trouble. You just have to fish it out, and it's ready to go. Rashi says, "Shmatzino tola katan, tanakama mehai time anami mechayevle bechagav tahor." He says, "It's the same." Why does the tanakama say that a person who walks around with a living kosher locust in his pocket? So that's a threshold of iser on Shabbos for the reason. Same reason as Rabbi Yehuda. What's the reason? That's what he would keep for to give to a child to play with. Just Rabbi Yehuda says, "Yeah, it could be non-kosher also." Umiu. Atame Palik. The argument is, is it what about Atame one? Reading Rashi, Rashi right before the, the Gemara. Right? Okay? Dilma Okay. The Tanakama says, that's the Chachamim, they say a person wouldn't keep uh Chagav Chai Tame, a non-kosher living locust, to his child for his child to play with, because he might end up eating it. So don't give your kid a cat or a dog or any other little animal to play with, a pet mouse. Why? Your, your, the child might come to eat it. No, that can't be. The answer is no, because they were used to eating locusts in the olden days. Now, the only reason they're talking about a locust is because sometimes locusts were actually eaten. That was something they used to do. They were not. If this were talking about a cat or a dog or a snake, no one, children don't get used to eating those things. And the difference between the kosher locust and the non-kosher locust, something actually is a very... Fine thing. It depends on its fine legs. I remember the Yemenite guy who showed us how you know it's a kosher locust. He says there's the shape of a chet like thing on its belly. Yeah, you've seen locusts like this? You know, there's those who those who eat them know them. So that's what Rashi says. The Machlokes, the Tanakama, and Rabbi Huda is with regards to a non-kosher living locust. Rabbi Huda says, yeah, a person would give that to his to his son as a as a pet to play with. And the Tanakama say a person would not do such a thing, lest he come to eat it. And the Gemara will discuss this some more. That's the threshold for the Isser. The Gemara continues, Urminhu, Zevel the Cholhadak, Kedel is Abel, Kelach shall crew, Divrei Rabbi Akiva, the Chamimurim, Kedel is Abel, Krisha. What are we talking about here? Enough Zevel. Well, what is Zevel? In this case, it's fertilizer. Okay? There's a threshold for carrying around fertilizer. All right? Or something else that they used to fertilize uh, this, uh, the kelach shall karuv, the stalk of cabbage. Nowadays we call cabbage stalk is uh, similar to uh, kale, produces leaves, right? Kelach shall karuv is the stalk. That's where the broccoli grows also. So what happens here? And that's what Rabbi Kiva says. Okay, enough to uh, fertilize. Your krisha, that's a, a crest, perhaps, or some other vegetable. So Rashi says, Kedel Isabel, Alma Zerahaba Migarinechad Hashiv. Okay. All it takes is one seed to get to the threshold. You plant one single seed, one kelach echad, one seed will produce one stalk, and now you could fertilize it. So that has significance. 
And all the other times we're talking about, well, seeds actually a few seeds enough that, uh, like it says at the, the bottom over here, Zeronegina, uh, Pachotmik, Progarit, but it's always talking about plural. See, Rashi says, Alma, Zerahabami, Garin, Echad, Tashiv. Okay. What, what are we trying to show? We're trying to show that when the, the Mishnah gave threshold numbers for all these different Zeronegina, and it's just Zeronegina. How much is Zeronegina? Pachotmik, Progarit. But it's plural. We have three different, three different sheets. Yeah. And Rabbi Yudas says, Hamisha. And it says, Zerah Kishuyim Shnaim, Zerah Deluyim Shnaim, Zerah Pua Mitzri Shnaim. So all these things were plurals. Right? Yeah. All the days in the Mishnah regarding planting seeds, seeds have the significance, plural. Here, Rashi says, the inference of Zevel, the Chol Hadak, Kedele Zabel, Kelach Shel Kru. One plant. They're both talking about one one plant. So one plant in the ground came from one seed. So that means one seed is significant. At least this isn't explicit, but that's the inference you would make. So this contradicts the Mishnah. Yeah, well, it, it, it implies a contradiction because the Mishnah said when you're talking about seeds meant for planting, at least all the all the opinions we saw were in the plural. Okay? And the minimum of a plural, like Hazal said, is Stein. Okay. So, and uh, by the way, and this also tells you, Derek Agav, we're learning Zevel, how much fertilizer. Okay? Enough to fertilize it. Omar Rav Papa, Ha de Zaria, Ha de Lo Zaria. Yeah, we're talking about one that's already been planted before planting and after planting. Once it's planted and it's already starting to grow, it's already significant. When it comes to the before planting, no one is silly enough to say one tomato seed, one cucumber seed. If you're going through all the trouble, you're going to plant a few. So it's always plural, before the planting. But sometimes in Achinami, let's say you planted a whole bunch of seeds. You have a large planter that's this long, like we have, and you put a seed here and a seed here and a seed here of five different tomato plants, but what starts growing? How many of them eventually start growing or getting significant? Sometimes, you know, hopefully all of them, but sometimes just one plant is very big and that's enough, and that's what that's what took root. I did this with this rogam years ago. I wanted an escrow tree, so I took a lot of chances. And uh, only one of them started growing, but it died after a few years. But it eventually happens. One seed, the one seed that succeeds, that's the one that has significance. So that's what Rashi is telling us here. After planting, each one has significance. In the ground, they all have significance. A person will go out of his way to fertilize one of them, the one he sees growing. So this one needs help. Okay. Before it's planted, no one's silly enough to plant one. Okay. By the way, biologically speaking, all species take this take this approach, at least all male species. Anything as a male, right? Male ga Males produce gametes in large numbers, <clears> right? <throat> How many sperm does it take to fertilize an egg? It takes one. How uh, uh, A human male, what's his usual sperm count? Healthy? To show he's fertile? Hundreds of millions. And that's the way, well, yes, wow. The guy you heard, that is, you know, it could be you know, the, the, a sperm count of 10 million. That's actually quite bad, okay? So this is the way all male species work. They have a lot of, you take a lot, like, uh, like uh, he says, you miss 100% of the shots you don't take. So before Zriya, a person's only going to trouble himself a significant, significant amount of seeds to plant. But once the plants are growing, they're in the ground, and there's a single stalk growing, that stalk is worth investing. So he's going to move Zevel for it. Yeah, I don't know. I, 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 I've done this so many times that, yeah, this is, this is what happens. You plant and you plant, and you hope that, you'll get a few that will actually start growing. And eventually you'll have a nice escrow tree. Yeah. So, to sort of summarize this, yeah. if, if you hire one of the saw, one seed is not significant, and if I carry it out, I'm not possible. Yeah. Correct? Yeah, that's what the Mishnah says. Okay. But if I take that one seed after I carry it out, from which I put her, and I put it in the ground, starts to I grow. Well, your high is real. Okay, high is real, one hundred percent. That's not what we're talking about here. He's saying because the next case was the yeah. no. The next hotzal was now he sees he planted all these kruv. He planted a lot of cabbage seeds. 
one cabbage stalk is growing, he will trouble himself to move the fertilizer to that cabbage seed. Because now that cabbage seed is a stalk, it's already growing cabbages. Now it's worth fertilizing. Now it's worth taking out a cup of water and giving it water individually. That's not the issue we're talking about. No, we're talking about, yeah, that is the issue. That, that, the yeah. whole question was raised about the, the contradiction between the numbers. Our, our mission is at a minimum of two. Yeah. And here it says one. Well, it doesn't say one. It implies one. It, it, the implication, that's the, the whole purpose of, of the discussion here. Yeah, it says that, but the one of the significance of the one is not for planting and not for hotza. It's for hotza of zevil for the sake of this one. Hotza, yeah. What, what's the purpose of bringing this whole gemara? The purpose of this gemara is, yeah, the purpose of the gemara is to say that. Well, I see that this one stalk which came from one seed has significance. If it has significance as one, and I could do malacha for it only on its behalf. So it must have been, even before it was planted, it has significance as just one. And the answer is no, something changed. Before the seeds were planted, they had no individual significance. They were significant as a group. But once they're in the ground and they take root and they start to grow, each individual counts. Like uh, like any other case, you know, there's a, that's how, that's how humanity works. You know, we, we only consider a fetus to be, you know, significant once it's a fetus. But beforehand, you know, uh, because I'll say what they say about that tipus rucha and or lechus rucha, you know. Even though technically speaking, it has a lot more potential than that. <coughs> now I'm trying to find something to, to share with you here. It's, uh, okay, Thomas Mann. Um, so this will be extra credit. Any questions or comments until this point? No. This rabbi, uh, the Tuesday. Tuesday. Well, I think we I think. Thank you very much. For your, oh, sure. Okay. It's always a pleasure to be here. Yeah. I'm sorry, I'm supposed to have something here. Whatever. We have uh, I have uh, very proud. It took me a long time to finally get the S rogues growing. And but now uh I have like five very nice and rogan, large, ripest rogam on the tree. The problem is they were not ready at Sukkot time. They're still, you know, as green as a leaf. But uh now they're ready. So I'm just hoping they'll make it to the next season and we'll to use them. Have a good one, everybody. Good week. We would like to encourage our viewers to share these videos with friends and send in your responses. If you would like to obtain Birkon Nusach Eretz Yisrael or invite the rabbi for a speaking engagement, please email us at office at machonchilo.org.